Is this on? Okay. Yeah, first off, uh, my name is Rich Schechter, Riverside Township Supervisor. I'd like to thank you for being patient. Bill has showed up. I uh, would like to thank my board for supporting us in this lecture. Uh, Ann Kaminsky, Jenner, Wayne Geesman, Mary Rob Clark, who brought in all the fantastic stuff from Wisconsin. She was away this weekend. And the clerk, Leanne Blau. Now, I'd like to introduce you to Bill. He's from the Japanese American Citizens League. Bill? Thank you uh, very much, Rich. And I apologize for being late. I had something come up this morning, and I know that's not an excuse. And then as I was coming over here, I think I zigged when I should have zagged and, and all of that sort of thing. But I finally made it here and kind of want to thank all of you for the patience you've shown in, in waiting. Um, gosh, this probably goes back several months, huh, Rich, when you uh, invited me to attend uh, this afternoon to speak about uh, an event which is in some ways a story of what befell a community during a very, very critical time uh, in American history, that is during World War II. And I think as I relate this to you, you're going to hopefully see how events, how a group that was very vulnerable, uh, came into a situation where, and I don't always like to use the word victimized, but we're victimized actually during uh, World War II. Um, I'm gonna start this by really talking about something that happened decades after the 1940s. Uh, in 1980, there was a federal commission Formed. It was called the Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians. And it was a commission that was put together uh, through an act of Congress and through a bill that was passed or, or signed by the president, then Jimmy Carter. So this goes back a little ways, but you know, it's not ancient history. And that commission was formed to investigate the facts and the circumstances surrounding the issuance of an executive order by President Roosevelt during World War II. The reason why that bill was passed and this commission was formed was because there were many who felt that what happened to Japanese Americans during World War II was an unresolved injustice. And that commission, it was headed by uh, various prominent Americans, um, among whom were Walter or uh, Arthur Goldberg, who was a former Justice of the United States uh, Supreme Court, various United States Senators, me current members of Congress, uh, and others. Um, and what they did was, was they held hearings around the country, starting in Washington, D.C., but they actually brought a hearing here to Chicago. And the reason for it was that during the war and following the incarceration, some Japanese left the camps, came and resettled in Chicago beginning in about 1943, 1944. So with that settlement of Japanese Americans here, it was felt that they should be able to testify before that commission to talk about what happened to them. And so what happened was, was they held hearings in Chicago, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Seattle. I think there were probably about seven or eight hearings held throughout the United States. There were two critical ones that were held in Washington, D.C. And those two hearings were held in order to elicit the testimony of some of those who were in the Roosevelt administration going back to the 1940s who were still living. Uh, at that time. But in any regard, what happened was, was that commission issued a report about two years later. And they basically said that what transpired during World War II toward this group of Americans, Japanese Americans, was an injustice. And that 
the causes of the internment, and they, they mentioned three major ones. Uh, racism, they said, wartime hysteria, and then a failure of political leadership, as they put it. So with that information, what I'll do is kind of go back in time then to tell you a little bit about what happened based upon those three findings. Again, racism, wartime hysteria, and a failure of political leadership. I think when a lot of people think of the incarceration during World War II, uh, they tend to think, well, the cause of it was Pearl Harbor, the bombing at Pearl Harbor. And certainly that was a catalytic event. You know, it precipitated uh, what followed. Um, but really to understand the situation of Japanese Americans, uh, you have to kind of go back, you know, 20, 30, 40, almost 50 years prior to that when Japanese first started immigrating to the United States in the 1890s. They came here for the same reasons that all immigrants came to this country, and that is to find political, or rather not political, but economic opportunity. And for many of the Japanese, they, had, they became engaged in agriculture, primarily on the West Coast. You know, they were living in Hawaii first, and then in California, Oregon, and in the state of Washington. So particularly, you know, uh, uh, Practically the entire population of Japanese that was in the United States at that time uh, were on the West Coast or in the West Coast states. Sure, there were a few of them that had come to even to places like Chicago, and you could almost count them on your hands. You know, maybe a couple, two, three hundred, I think, in the census of 1940 showed about that many. So there weren't very many. Virtually all uh, were on the West Coast. When they began settling in California. Oregon uh, and in Washington, uh, they were met with a lot of hostility. You know, just like with the Chinese that kind of like predated the Japanese in their immigration, they seemed to be different culturally, they spoke a different language, um, and as a result, they were pretty well isolated, ostracized, and marginalized within the communities uh, where they were living. Um, it wasn't uncommon for the state of California, in fact, to pass laws that would particularly be aimed at Japanese. Uh, laws, for example, where they couldn't get licensed to live, you know, to practice particular professions. They lived in segregated enclaves uh, in places like California. In fact, there were laws, they were called alien land laws that were passed where Japanese couldn't buy property uh, because uh, many of them couldn't become citizens. In fact, that kind of brings up a fairly important point that according to laws that were passed way back in the 1790s, there's something called the Naturalization Act. It said that you couldn't become naturalized as a citizen in this country unless you were 18, free, and white. Well, that law was passed specifically to, uh, you know, to, to focus upon the black, the African American community, but when uh, the Supreme Court began hearing cases on it, Asians collectively and Japanese Americans, or Japanese in particular who had immigrated here, fell under that very same law. So all the immigrants the first generation who came to this country couldn't become naturalized as citizens. So when you pass a law, like an alien land law in California, where you couldn't buy property, that excluded every Japanese immigrant who came to the United States. What happened was, was that the Japanese became really, really successful in agriculture particularly in California, but also in Oregon, also in Washington. And you can imagine that even today, you know, agriculture in California is a major industry. If you look at the headlines today where they talk about the drought situation out in California, the fight is between agricultural interests and urban interests and who's going to get the water. 
And so the reason for it, obviously, is because of the uh, huge influence of the agricultural industry in the Central Valley, especially along the Central Valley uh, in California. In any event, Japanese become very, very successful in agriculture in California. By the 19-teens, 1920s, they are probably controlling about probably over 50% of the truck farming crops in California. That's the lettuce, you know, all of the stuff that you see on the, you know, on, on the grocery, or the, on the vegetable shelves, uh, basically. So that what happens is it kind of riles up the farm interests like the Grange, you know, a farm lobby in California, or farm lobby really across the United States. Uh, as well as other interest groups, there was a group called the Native Sons of the Golden West, for example. They didn't like the fact that a lot of immigration of Asians, or Japanese in particular, were coming to California. So what happened was, was that they expressed their dissatisfaction the politicians begin picking up on it, and so you kind of get a lot of other types of exclusionary laws like the alien land law. At that time, uh, you also had these housing covenants, so people couldn't just live anywhere they wanted to. Japanese were confined to their own uh, ethnic enclaves. Uh, couldn't marry whites either. I mean, there were anti-miscegenation laws uh, at that point. Couldn't go to school with whites for example. So it was a very segregated environment for the Japanese and it became very hostile too with all of the you know all of the competition for for agriculture and so forth in those three west coast states. So that's kind of what the environment is like uh, for the Japanese. And then comes Pearl Harbor and you can imagine that with all of that kind of built up hostility being directed at this community while all you needed was one more thing to really kind of set the wheels in motion for something fairly traumatic to happen. And that's exactly what did happen. Pearl Harbor occurs. Um, what happens immediately is that the FBI swoops into the community and starts rounding up individuals. They end up by December 7th or 8th and this happened like that quickly, uh, something like 1,100 uh, first-generation Japanese who were uh, deemed to be the leaders in the community. They were the heads of organizations. They were successful uh, business people. They were the editors of newspapers and other publications. They were the folks who ran these martial, even martial arts schools, that kind of thing. So, so the idea was to, that, the, that the government or the FBI had was to take the leadership basically out of the community uh, for fear that somehow if bad stuff was going to happen, uh, the leadership would be, you know, the cause of it. Um, by February of the next year, 1942, uh, double that number had been arrested and what, they were, what happened to them was they were sent off to these so-called justice uh, internment camps in very desolate areas, places like Santa Fe uh, in New Mexico, which then wasn't you know, one of these real recreational spots as it is today. Bismarck uh, in North Dakota, Moab uh, in Utah, you know, places you would never otherwise think about. Um, and then also, it, one of the interesting things was, was that there was kind of a relative calm on the West Coast right after that. Uh, here, and I'm talking about the, you know, the, the months or the, the weeks coming up on the holidays in December. Um, and and there, was, there, were, there weren't outward calls uh, to, to do anything uh, with respect to the Japanese population. But then right after the turn of the year, in 1942, all of a sudden, you start seeing these kind of blaring news headlines in papers, especially the Hearst newspapers that were headquartered in San Francisco, um, uh, started uh, having blaring headlines about, uh, you know, about the, you know, what was going on um, uh, in terms of, of Japan in, the, you know, in Asia, in terms of the war. Uh, newspaper columnists started to actually write columns that talked about the danger that was posed by 
the Japanese who were in the United States at that point. So it wasn't, and it wasn't just the Hearst newspaper chain, it was also a newspaper chain called the McClatchy newspaper chain, which was headquartered out of Sacramento uh, in California. So think about it um, in terms of what the media was during that time. You know, you didn't have television, right? You had radio, you had newspapers, and you had probably those, those, those newsreels that, that would show during the, the movies that, that folks went to. So those were the only sources of, of news. And when the radio, uh, through these kind of, of commentators, and when the newspapers, in terms of the columns and so forth, start you know, a very, very concerted effort to portray Japanese, in the most negative of ways, you can imagine what the perception becomes, the public perception becomes, uh, regarding that group of people. So what happens, too, is, is that, that the um, uh, politicians on the West Coast not all, but most of them started picking up on this. And so talk of, of doing something about this so-called Japanese problem. This factors into that second reason that I talked about, this whole notion of wartime hysteria. When you get uh, a national crisis, like the entry of a country like the United States into war, of course there's going to be fear. Uh, and of course there's going to be a reaction uh, somehow in expressing that kind of fear. We knew what was going on in the media. The politicians begin picking up on it. And then after a certain point in time, President Roosevelt uh, decides that he's got to do something about it. And he's being influenced by his advisors, his, you know, the, the, which the Defense Department then was called the War Department. There was one person in charge of that, of the, of the so-called Japanese uh, problem on the West Coast. His name was John McCloy. He was um, the Assistant Secretary of War, later became a very, very prominent um, uh, individual, uh, you know, within, within the private and governmental sectors. But what happens is, is that Roosevelt signs an executive order. It's Executive Order 9066. And what that order says is that any and all individuals um, can be removed from a designated area um, uh, 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 if, you know, if the occasion arises where, where there is that kind of a need. And then it was left to the military to implement that executive order. And the way that executive order got implemented was, was that it selectively targeted Japanese. Remember here that two-thirds of the population of Japanese on the West Coast at that time were American citizens. You know, they were born here. Um, those who were the immigrants couldn't become citizens, as I mentioned before, because they were naturalized. Uh, but what they did was they kind of invented a language, as it were. They, they called the, those who were citizens, they called them non-aliens, is what they said, just to kind of you know, create, um, you know, some kind of a, a euphemism, I guess, to, to kind of deal with, with the perception of just rounding up citizens. We're not rounding up citizens, we're rounding up non-aliens, okay, as if that makes it uh, any different. So what happens then is, is that um, the, the um, Western Defense Command, the United States Army, headquartered out of the Presidio in San Francisco, is given the task of securing the West Coast, which they did. Um, but then it was felt that, gee, we need to take care of this problem, which has kind of magnified itself because the politicians are now telling us that this is what we need to do. Um, and that's basically what happened, was that, that um, that uh, General John DeWitt, who was the commander of the Western Defense Command, um, interpreted that order to mean to exclude all Japanese living on the West Coast. And so what he did was, was he put forward a, a whole series of what were called civilian exclusion orders that targeted 
only the Japanese. And the orders called for the removal of folks and eventually putting them in the 10 so-called concentration camps in very desolate areas of the country. The way this happened was, was that, that um, what they would do is they would post these notices in neighborhoods or areas where Japanese lived. And it basically said that if you are of Japanese ancestry, uh, you need to report to such and such a place at such and such a time, at which point trucks and buses would pick folks up and deliver them to these temporary facilities known then as assembly centers. And, and these were places where you could house like large groups of people. Um, in Los Angeles, it was the Santa Anita racetrack. And what they did, what the government did essentially was to move all of the animals, all the horses out, all of the, you know, all of the racing people out of there, and they moved the Japanese in, uh, literally into horse stalls that had been whitewashed, basically. Um, and people were confined there for uh, periods of up to three, four months as they were constructing the permanent camps in places like Manzanar is the name of one that was in the Owens Valley in California, one valley over from Death Valley, places like uh, Heart Mountain in Wyoming. The nearest to Chicago were two camps in the Delta region of Arkansas. One was called Roar and the other one was called Poston. Um, they were desolate in their own way. You know, they were kind of swamplands. They were areas where people really didn't want to be. Um, but the whole idea was to find these kinds of location, gen or these locations, and they were generally on government uh, property. Before I tell you about what those camps were like, let me just go back a little bit to this whole notion again of the wartime hysteria, the fear, and the uh, sense of, of the, the Japanese American population being a threat uh, militarily or, you know, in, in the United States. Um, what the White House or what the administration had done, and this is, is much before December 7th, this is probably over a year prior to the bombing at Pearl Harbor, they had sent an envoy out to the West Coast to surveil the community, to find out does this community really pose a security risk to the United States. That investigator's name was Curtis Munson. He was out there on behalf of the White House. He went to various communities on the West Coast uh, in Washington, or rather in Washington State, Oregon, California, went to the cities, Los Angeles, San Francisco, even spoke to folks in the community to try to make a determination, does this community pose a significant security risk to the United States in the event that something happens with Japan, meaning if we enter war, if we get into war with Japan. He, he finalizes his report, goes back to Washington, and basically reports that this community does not pose a security risk. In fact, in his report, he says that this community, and he used the term pathetically loyal. He said this community is pathetically loyal to the United States. This is, you know, what you're talking about in 1942 is you're talking about the first generation, you know, being in their late 50s, 60s, they're becoming a little bit older, and that the second generation population are in their late teens, some of them are in their 20s and so forth, and you can imagine like any immigrant group, uh, that, that second generation, that generation that's born here, really tries to adapt itself and assimilate itself to the mainstream culture. And that's what was going on with Japanese Americans. They could assimilate up to a point. I mean, they kind of had the Japanese space, so that kind of like, you know, doesn't make it easy for them to like melt in right to the larger society. But culturally, you know, they were American, sure, they had the, you know, the influence of their parents, but 
not to any greater extent than any other um, uh, person of that age would have who was born here and had immigrant parents. It wasn't just Munson's report, but the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover at that time, had also surveilled the community. FBI's in charge of domestic tranquility, right? I mean, there's to protect, uh, they're, they're there to protect our, our, our domestic interests. They had surveilled the community and they came up with much the same conclusion that Munson had reached. Uh, Naval intelligence, another security branch of the government at that time, uh, uh, had come up with the same conclusion. So all of these reports are in. Um, and the recommendations or the conclusions are all the same, but they never went any further than that. And part of the reason for it was, I think that, that there was, you know, a lot of the politics of all of this had kind of taken over. Um, there was the fear that was in the atmosphere, you know, still kind of in the culture uh, uh, at the time. And so what had started um, in terms of this whole snowball effect of trying to do something about the community, you know, almost was out of control. It, it, it wasn't going to stop. And so it just proceeded. And so that's where you get to this, um, you know, the executive order, the, you know, the tone in the press and all of that. So what happens then is, is that uh, there is that decision to incarcerate all Japanese Americans, presumably for national security interests. They called it military necessity at that time, but national security is exactly, is, is essentially what it came down to. And as a result, they, there, there were constructed 10 camps. Each of the camps held approximately 10,000 people each. There were about 110, 120,000 uh, Japanese Americans residing on the West Coast at that time. Um, the situations, they were literally barracks. You know, they were about 120 feet long by about 20 feet wide. Um, barren, except for a potbelly stove in each of the barracks, which was used for heat. Um, imagine yourself, I guess, in the middle of a Wyoming desert uh, uh, during the summer, first of all, where the temperatures get, you know, pretty hot. It's, 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 it, you get to desert temperatures and, and you can imagine that if you're constructing these barracks very, very quickly, you've got a lot of the cracks and all of that in the floorboards and in the walls. They put tar, you know, tar paper on the walls to, you know, kind of keep out some of the dust, but, you know, that's one of the things that you you know, that, that you read about in terms of the, the testimony of individuals who were in these camps. I mean, the, just the dust creeping in was just uh, totally unavoidable and it became more than just a nuisance. During the winter time, the temperatures creep down to, you know, well under, under freezing and, you know, down to zero below. And you can imagine that folks who had grown up in Southern California, what their you know, disposition was to that kind of a climate. So it was quite a dramatic, dramatic change for them. Um, you had about three families or three units, family units that were put into each of these barracks. They didn't have walls or partitions between each. What people initially did was they would just run a clothesline across and then put, um, sheets or whatever, you know, to partition off uh, each of the different, um, uh, or to define each of the different units within that 120-foot uh, expanse. Um, and if, you know, if I would have been thinking, I would have brought some photos for you because, it, you know, when you look at places like Heart Mountain or Manzanar, it's just row upon row upon row upon row of these barracks. Um, People didn't cook their own food. Uh, the, the toilet facilities weren't in the barrack uh, itself. They, you had to go out. Everything was totally communal. Um, I was just at, I, I take a group of students to uh, visit Manzanar every year. We just got back in June, and it was the third time I had been to Manzanar. I'm just, I'm, you know, it's, it's just something that, that, I guess until you're there and you see the conditions, you know, you, can, you just can't imagine. Uh, how harsh they are. It's, 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 it's in a valley that otherwise is a very beautiful valley. You know, if you go 
uh, uh, there. You're, it's, it's bounded by mountains. It's bounded by the, you know, the Sierras, and it's just, you know, it can be a beautiful thing. But uh, imagine, uh, you know, pe people being put out there, you know, for periods of the three, four years at a time, and that's what you you had. Um, the meals were taken in mess halls, um, community mess halls. Uh, the activity in camp was one where folks, for the most part, were fairly idle. There were jobs that people could have, um, uh, and they were paid at different levels. If you were, you know, like a, if you had gone to medical school or nursing school, that sort of thing, uh, you, were, you would be hired for like $19 a month uh, at that point. Other, you know, the other jobs they had, and it could be anything from, you know, uh, being a recreational counselor or, or perhaps even a teacher were paid in lesser amounts, $16 down to $12 a month. But most people, you know, weren't, you know, they, they, they weren't uh, engaged in those kinds of, of, of activities. At Manzanar, there was a, uh, there was a, I wanted, I hesitate to call it a factory, but there was like a camouflage facility where uh, the, the, um, uh, those who were in camp, if they wanted to, they could, you know, get a job making these camouflage nets. Um, uh, but beyond that, a lot of people be just became very resourceful, and they, you know, they were, they, they started planting their own crops and, and so forth. But, but by and large, it was a fairly, um, I don't know, I'm not quite sure, it's, it's really hard to describe, but it was a very desperate kind of, of, of an existence uh, that folks had. Uh, as I mentioned, though, after a point, folks could leave the camps if they were deemed um, to not be a security risk. Uh, and if they could find a job or have someone sponsor them, but they couldn't return to the West Coast because that was kind of a, a you know, that was, you know the, the ban on the West Coast was there through that executive order uh, that I had mentioned earlier. And so they would come to places like Chicago, Minneapolis, and uh, St. Louis, and you know, a lot of the Midwest cities or Eastern cities as well, and try to make the best of it. Um, that's what my parents did. Yeah, they left there. They, were, they, were, they had been living in Seattle. Uh, they were sent to Heart Mountain in Wyoming. Um, my father, a very, very kind of impatient person, didn't like the, you know, what was going on there in camp, decided at the first opportunity he would try to leave. He did, came here to Chicago uh, and, and got a job working at um, a place called the Edgewater Beach Hotel, which I guess is no longer there anymore, but uh, was then a kind of a resort hotel that was right on the lake. Uh, um, and then remained in Chicago until the end of the war, at which point people who were in those camps could return uh, uh, to, the, to the West Coast. And when they did, you know, a lot of them, when they had left initially, they could only take with them what they could carry. That's what, the, on these posters that I mentioned that were kind of put on these, these uh, uh, telephone posts and so forth, saying that you had to you know, you, you assemble at a certain place at a certain time to be picked up. What those, those posters also said, you could only take with you personal effects that you could carry. You know, you couldn't take your refrigerator, you couldn't take your car, you couldn't take your coffee table or your bed or your dresser. You could take what you could throw in a duffel bag or in a suitcase. And so many, for many, that meant, that meant clothing. Uh, it meant... Um, you know, whatever treasured items they, they might have had uh, that weren't uh, 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 kind of like verboten to take with them. They couldn't take cameras, for example, because cameras were deemed then to be, you know, could be used for espionage or that, that type of thing. By the way, um, during the war, uh, it was, you know, there was never, ever a documented case of any kind of espionage, sabotage, or any other kind of fifth column activity uh, that uh, committed by any, you know, any Japanese, Japanese American. Uh, so a lot of what Hoover, J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI, what, what this uh, uh, Curtis Munson had said was borne out. 
Um, and even more than that, there was a point in time when Japanese Americans could even volunteer uh, in the services, the armed services, the army uh, specifically. Uh, and they did so and served in a segregated unit. It was called the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. Uh, there was also a group out of Hawaii. There were a significant number of Japanese Americans who were living in Hawaii at that time, and they formed the, the 100th Infantry Battalion. Uh, they combined those two units at some point during the war, and they went on to become the most highly decorated unit uh, in U.S. military uh, history. Uh, so, so obviously they were, you know, kind of able to, to you know, prove who they were and, and what they were uh, fighting about. Um, after the war, as I said, people went back to, to their, a lot of them went back to their, their places in California, Washington, and Oregon. In some cases, they were able to recover you know, some of their possessions or their property, if they had it, uh, through the act of kind neighbors who would, you know, try to, to safeguard uh, their property. But by and large, the vast majority of folks lost everything that they had. Because for many, if they owned property, they were in the camp, um, they didn't have any kind of income, uh, and as a result, um, couldn't make the you know payments on their homes and had their ended up having their uh, property uh, foreclosed on. So they lost you know they lost their big property uh, in that way. Farmers who had oftentimes left huge farm implements that kind of thing on their property. Some as I said returned and were able to recover it, but again many weren't so fortunate um, and they had it. You know, I mean, there was nothing there uh, when they, they got back. So, uh, so most folks simply had to start all over uh, again. And, um, and, and they did, and they did. Um, and, and I think what I'll do at this point is, is to uh, kind of, of end it by, by just um, indicating that, that in 1982, that commission report, which, as I had mentioned at the outset, said basically that what happened to Japanese Americans during World War II uh, was unjust and it was wrong, that several years thereafter, in August of 1988, uh, Ronald Reagan, then president, signed a bill which apologized uh, to those who were affected by that incarceration. Um, and each, if they were eligible, uh, received $20,000 as a symbolic gesture on the part of the government. Because, you know, in the end, how can you place a monetary value right on, on, on things like uh, uh, freedom, or how could you you know, try to, 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 to you know, uh, determine for many of them what their losses had been, real losses had been in terms of, of, of property. Uh, there were attempts, by the way, to, to, to answer that. In 1948, there was something called the Evacuation Claims Act, but it just simply, you know, in the end, didn't turn out to be uh, the kind of a vehicle, legislative vehicle, uh, for people to, to have their, you know, their, their uh, property or, or other personal effects compensated for because many weren't able to document in the end what they, what they had lost or those documents had been uh, uh, lost. So, so when we get to 1988, then that $20,000 compensation is simply a symbolic gesture on the part of the government. So that uh, pretty much concludes, and I, you know, I, 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 there's a lot that I've kind of glazed over uh, in all of this, but I'd just be very, very pleased to answer any kinds of questions that any of you might have uh, with respect to any of this. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah. You know, that's an excellent question. You know, uh, the gentleman speaks about this 442nd Regimental Combat Team and, you know, how, how is it that they uh, found the strength to do what they did and, and um, you know, uh, put up the record that they finally did. I've talked to, you know, over the years, a number of those veterans and, um, you know, part, I think part of, part of it is, and, you know, I mean, even in today, it, you know, kind of sound, doesn't, it kind of sounds a little bit out, you know, kind of out there in a way, but, but it's, I, it was really this whole notion of, of really having to prove your loyalty when you, you know, really didn't in some ways. But I think the reality of situations sometimes is, is that that really becomes true, you know, in terms of people's perceptions of communities. Um, you know, you, you, you do have to do something to kind of show that you really are an American. And a lot's what a lot of these, these um, uh, veterans had told me, that they, they, I think they did it for a lot of reasons, but I think this whole notion of, 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 of trying to do it to, to make a statement about who they were as Americans, their motto was go for broke. And it was one of these things where that said, you know, we're going to do everything that we can uh, to, you know, to, to, pr to prove what we are. Um, and, and so I guess just kind of in a collective way, that, that kind of is the, the, the general response uh, that I get back. I think, too, that, that there's kind of this whole series of, of things that their families had gone through. Um, and I, I think also, too, in thinking about their future generations, you know, there's this thing about doing things uh, kind of for the sake of the children uh, uh, in looking ahead. And, and that's kind of, too, the, you know, like the response that I would get back from these veterans. But I think it was this whole notion of somehow being ostracized and somehow having to, to make a statement about who they were as American citizens. Yeah, it was, it was only the coast. What happened was was that that uh, right after the bombing at Pearl Harbor, there was a zone one that was defined right along the west coast of the United States. It was a fairly, fairly narrow band that took into consideration the metropolitan areas of places like Portland, Seattle, going down San Francisco, uh, Los Angeles. And so that, that um, uh, and what happened was, was that within those, that zone one, there were also established things like curfews, so that if you were Japanese, Japanese American, uh, you had to be in your home by 8 o'clock p.m. and you couldn't leave your home until 6 a.m. the following morning. And that curfew prohibition, you know, only extended to those who were Japanese. Um, that law was, you know, there, I should mention too that, that during that period of time, it's not as if the community, the Japanese American community, sat idly by. There were individuals who, d who said that, what's going on here? I'm an American, you know, I should be able to, you know, you can't do this to me without due process of some sort. And so there were individuals who challenged that exclusion order who said that I'm an American citizen, you can't tell me that I have to leave this particular place where I'm residing and report to this assembly center. Um, and so there were several cases that came up in that curfew, there was a curfew case that came up. But in every instance, when those cases finally found their way to the Supreme Court, there were three major ones. One was called Korematsu versus the United States. Another was called Yasui versus the United States. That was a curfew order. And there was one called Hirabayashi uh, versus the United States. In each instance, the court ruled that because of military necessity, as they said, um, that was, again, the term they used, because of the, 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 the military necessity, um, the safety of the country takes precedence over, you know, over, over what we are doing to United States citizens.
Remember here, what happened is, is that these people were taken from their homes, American citizens, they weren't afforded, they were never charged with any kind of a crime, or even a misdemeanor, but no crime, uh, and they weren't afforded due process, that is, they weren't afforded uh, a day in court. And so, and this is a right that every American has, you know, whether you're out there for a traffic violation or anything else, uh, but not in this particular case because of this so-called military necessity. There's kind of an underlying story to all of this too, this kind of, of, kind of, of, of interest is, is that when these cases went before the Supreme Court, the uh, attorney on behalf of the government knew very well about the, the um, FBI findings, about the findings of Munson and so forth, and all of that was kind of put aside. They never brought this up as mitigating evidence for the, for the you know, on behalf of the uh, Japanese American community. And years later, and this is during the 1980s, there was a case brought that was called an error quorum nobis case by a group of Japanese American attorneys uh, living in San Francisco. They brought a case up, it went to a federal court, and what happened as a result of it was that the case of this Hirabay or not Hirabayashi, but Korematsu versus the United States, Fred Korematsu, his, his, uh, his um, uh, case, the sentence was, was basically vacated. The judge said that, you know, this evidence was known then and the court should have ruled otherwise. The case wasn't overturned. All these cases are still on the books and they serve as precedents. And it's kind of interesting that, you know, back in, what, 2001, right after um, the um, Twin Towers um, attacks and so forth, when the uh, Arab American Muslim community was under siege in the United States, there was talk about finding ways to deal with that community and even going to the extent of perhaps rounding uh, them up and perhaps even confining them somewhere. Uh, but the whole notion of what happened to Japanese Americans and specifically the case of Korematsu came up and many folks just wanted to shy away from doing it because they didn't want to create the same kind of, of, of situation that occurred at least on the scale of what took place back in 1942. Yes, way in the back. Rich. I think that, I don't know if, if, if they made statements saying, you know, that using the word that they were ashamed by it, but there were certainly statements to separate themselves from the actions of, of Japan at that time. You know, a lot of them, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting because um, 
you know, many, many of these individuals had, you know, if they were living, if they were born here, they had, I mean, they had, you know, no claim to Japan at all. I mean, their, their, their loyalty was clearly to the country in which they were born. Um, but there were attempts, I think, on the part of organizations at that time to try to step forward saying, you know, trying to, to make the distinction and saying that, you know, we're American citizens, we're not part of, of what happened. Uh, at Pearl Harbor, and that kind of goes to the amount of support I think that the Japanese American community received during that time. There were some individuals who spoke out and said, you know, you can't do this to this group of people. There was a, a group called the American Friends Service Committee, their Quaker organization, that uh, stepped up, and I think they were probably one of the only large organizations who tried to, to, to say anything. Um, you know, back in the uh, uh, 1980s, I remember that, you know, I was helping to work on this, this legislation that was eventually passed by, or signed by, by, by Ronald Reagan, and I remember talking to then uh, Senator Paul Simon, some of you may who remember him, he was a fairly progressive um, uh, United States Senator here in Illinois. And he told me that his father, he was living at that time, he was a young man too, you know, probably about an eight-year-old uh, living in, in uh, the Portland, Oregon area. And he said his father was a, a minister and he tried to speak out on behalf of the Japanese American population in the Portland area there saying that you can't do this, you know, to this group of, of people. And, and Senator Simon says that he remembers or he kind of recalls being really ashamed of what his father was saying um, because his friends would kind of like, you know, would, would kind of gang up on him and say, your dad is saying this and your dad is saying that about, the, you know, about those, those people who did this uh, to us. But upon reflection, he also said that many, many years later and even up until that point that I talked to him, he said that was one of the greatest lessons uh, that he had learned, you know, about standing up uh, against, you know, whatever the popular sentiment, wrong, you know, was at the time that might, you know, might or was wrong uh, at that time. So it was a, was a real lesson. But part of it was that, that um, the community was fairly powerless during that time, regardless of what they would have said. What happened to them was going to happen. I don't think that there was any way you know, and to, I think, be able to stand up and say something might have mollified a few, you know, in the immediate area, but it wouldn't have had a larger effect on, on what eventually transpired for the entire community. Yes? I'm curious, is to, you said your father was able to leave. Were the camps guarded? Yeah, the question is, were the camps guarded? Um, you know, these camps, as I said, they're row upon row of barracks. They're surrounded by gar barbed wire. They had guard towers at each corner and along. They were a mile, one mile square is what they were. And they had guard towers, they had uh, guards in the guard towers who had weapons and they were looking in to make sure that, that uh, nobody left the camps. Uh, you couldn't go within a certain, you know, I don't know, three, three yards or, you know, there was a kind of a security barrier you couldn't cross. Uh, around the barbed wire uh, 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 fences, um, and there were instances where people were shot and they were killed when they wandered too close uh, to that fence. So yes, they were um, they they were they were held there by by armed guards. Yeah, I, I, you know, I mean, I, I don't have an in-depth knowledge about that. I mean, I think that there are books, you know, like At Dawn We Slept, uh, that talks about what uh, Roosevelt, you know, may have known. But there was, you know, I think just the, the fact that the community would have been surveilled like a year, 18 months out, you know, said that there was a lot of intelligence that was gathered and there was a lot of, 
action that was going on in the Pacific, you know, long before Pearl Harbor, uh, that that saw, you know, that that, that could have uh, have kind of like foreshadowed, um, you know, America's entry into the war. Um, you know, remember too, and this is this is not to to. Um, uh, uh, you know, I guess talk negatively about America's entry into the war because, one, you know, a nation has to protect itself. But at the same time, you know, the country was, you know, com kind of coming out of the 1930s, obviously, during a time of great economic uh, depression. Wars do tend to economically recover uh, uh, a nation. Roosevelt during that time uh, was um, was uh, uh, you know leasing shipping to the British uh, uh, for you know for uh, who you know had actually uh, entered into to World War II and and I know that that Great Britain had wanted America to enter World War II and so I think that there was uh, you know according to some theories this whole notion that. Uh, uh, that hopefully there would some, there'd be something that would propel this country into war, and that was part of this whole lend-lease kind of thing that was going on, because if an American, you know, ship of some sort had been, you know, sunk, that type of thing, that that could have been, you know, an, an instigating force. I, that's probably about as far as I, you know, knowledgeably would want to kind of get into it, because I know that that would, you know, stimulate other questions, and I would hate to not be able to, to answer them, so... Yes. Were any German Americans or Italian Americans put in jail? Yeah, the question is, were there any German Americans or Italians that were put into camps? That's it's a really a, a, an interesting question because um, we were at war with Germany, we were at war with, with Italy. So what goes on with with uh, you know their 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 populations here in this country? Um, the populations were handled differently. The German population, the Italian population, they were surveilled in the same kind of way. Um, there was fear, you know, that, that there could be reprisals or there could be uh, acts of espionage um, uh, in the United States. And so, but what happened was, was that for Germans or Italians, Americans, uh, if they were thought to be of a, you know, a risk to this country, they were individually reviewed. There were actually, you know, they were, they were, they were given due process and they, you know, granted it wasn't great, but there was due process, uh, which wasn't afforded Japanese. So, so there weren't, there weren't uh, 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 German Americans or Italian Americans who were confined in large numbers in camps. There were, there were roundups, that kind of thing. Yes, that occurred. Interestingly, too, that, that um, you know, there were German POWs and even Italian POWs that were housed in American camps during the war. Uh, in fact, there was one camp in Texas, it was in Crystal City uh, in Texas that held Japanese, Americans, um, and, and as well um, um, uh, Jap or, uh, um, Italians and, and Germans who were, who were POWs. Yes? A couple of things. First of all, I, I think, uh, getting back to the 442nd, I think part of uh, obviously being patriotic Americans plus having the Japanese cultural uh, traditions of honor might have played into that too. Sure. Um, also, uh, yeah. I have to tell you, my mother was, and is Italian, and, and she had five brothers in the war, and I, I'm just uh, glad they all survived, and I'm glad they never did uh, to the Italian population what they did to the Japanese population. Um, also, there's um, a new book out, and, and this is something, I read a lot of history I never knew about. People think of the Pacific War being a war in hot climates, but uh, there was also a war in the Alaskan area, the Aleutian Islands. And um, it turns out that both the Americans and the Japanese uh, military were uh, interning uh, Aleutian uh, people. Yeah. 
And I mean, why would they think that they pulled them for that? You know, that, that? That just surprised the heck out of me. Yeah, that's an interesting point, this whole notion of interning Aleuts um, in, you know, in, in, in Alaska. Um, that whole question was actually looked into by this federal commission that I mentioned. And in fact, you know, the Aleuts became part of the, those who were determined to be eligible for that compensation that I had talked about. And they, you know, they also received the apology. But um, what happened was, was that um, you know, the Aleutian chain was deemed to be kind of strategically of, of interest, you know, militarily, um, even today. Um, and so the native Alaskans, the Aleuts, you know, were, were similarly removed from where they were and they were put into, you know, they weren't put into, to, you know, these mass camps like they had, but they were kind of secluded off into to different areas. It was kind of like what happened with the Canadian, that's, that's a whole, you know, the whole Canadian Japanese thing was, that's a whole nother story because the same thing happened in Canada with Canadian Japanese, that they didn't create camps, but what happened was, was they were, they were um, removed from British Columbia, you know, right along the coastal areas there, British Vancouver and so forth, British, and they were put into the interior provinces, uh, primarily in these mining communi communities, um, and their treatment was, you know, was probably as harsh, if not harsher, than what happened with the uh, Japanese American population. You know, this story kind of, of you know, if you, if you want to extend it, it even goes to having Peruvian Japanese who were removed from Peru at the insistence of the United States State Department as a possibility for hostage exchange for American prisoners during that time. In fact, the underlying theme of a lot of this whole, you know, mass roundup of Japanese, even Japanese Americans um, uh, had some of its initial thinking in the idea of, of prisoner, you know, future prisoner exchanges uh, with, with, with Japan. So that underlied a lot of it. But in the end, it became, you know, more of a domestic kind of an issue because of, 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 of what was going on on the West Coast economically and all of that. But the Peruvian Japanese, um, it's, they're kind of an interesting uh, uh, question because the, you know, they were, they were um, the, as I said, the State Department urged the government of Peru to round up all of their Japanese citizens and, and those who weren't citizens. And the government of Peru was more than happy to do that because the Japanese who were there, it was kind of the same situation as in the United States. They had become fairly successful uh, agriculturally. And this was an easy solution to that kind of a problem. And so they were rounded up and they were sent to um, Crystal City uh, in Texas, uh, as, I met, as I had mentioned before, and um, uh, confined there. And the kind of the tragic part about their situation was, was that following World War II, the Peruvian government did not let them return to Peru. They weren't citizens of Japan. Here they were in the United States, and so they were kind of like stateless people. And so it, was, it became a very, very difficult situation for them. What happened to them? Well, a lot of them actually applied for, uh, what happened was that they stayed here, um, uh, and in 1952 there was a law passed having to do with the naturalization of Japanese, where it was called the McCarran-Walter Act. And once that was, was passed, then Japanese who were not citizens of the United States could become, or they could apply to become citizens. And a number of them did just that. They became American citizens and they stayed here. Yes? Yeah, there was, uh, that was a, there was a display, as you mentioned, where the Congressional Gold Medal was um, 
awarded to um, the 442nd, I think it was a year ago, last, last, uh, last fall, I, don't, I forget the, the date, it was sometime in November, but it's the, it's the highest um, recognition or award that can be granted by the United States Congress, um, and the 442nd was one of those. I think less than 100 of those Congressional Gold Medals have been conferred since, their, you know, since they were um, um, first awarded. Yes? one book to read on this subject? One book? Uh, what, what one book would you read? You know, one, it's interesting that, that the, there has been quite a, a, a um, I, I don't know, proliferation of books on, you know, having to do with that period of time. Um, you know, probably before 30, 20 years ago, there weren't a whole lot. And one of the things, by the way, that, that uh, we are still trying to um, push for strongly is to get this included, you know, within curriculum within the public schools. And that's kind of an ongoing effort, but it's something that we're trying to do. Um, one book, I think that one of the, I guess one of the first books that was written that had a great influence on the, on, on, on this whole notion that something should be done about what happened during World War II. It was called Years of Infamy, Years of Infamy. And the author was, is Michi, M-I-C-H-I, Wegland, W-E-G-L-Y-N. Uh, hers is probably, and that was a fairly influential book. One of the books that, that the um, students in California, all students in California are are uh, mandated to read. It's called Farewell to Manzanar. Farewell to Manzanar. Um, and uh, it's, it's written by a, uh, actually a woman, a third generation individual. It's, it's a real easy book to read. Kind of a more popular uh, a book is, it's called the, I think it's called Hotel at the Corner of Bitter and Sweet, right? And that's kind of a popular um, type of, of novel. Uh, it's actually good summer reading. Um, uh, very simple to read, and it has to do with uh, a, um, um, a Japanese-American woman and a Chinese man who were uh, kids growing up in, in Seattle, and, and kind of what happened to them and how the uh, Pearl Harbor disrupts their, their life. And it, it has to do with this hotel. I, I just kind of want to mention it because it's kind of, kind of neat in some ways. Because there's this place called the Panama Hotel in Seattle. And it used to be an old boarding house where a lot of Japanese um, um, bachelor men, I guess is the way to say it, used to just live there. And when World War II broke out, the owner of the hotel, who was a good friend to the Japanese community in Seattle, promised to kind of like hold on to a lot of their personal possessions. And so a lot of folks packed stuff up that they couldn't take with them, stored them in the basement of the Panama Hotel, which is still there today. And it was discovered, you know, fairly recently, when I say fairly recently, you know, 20, 25 years ago, that a lot of these suitcases were still there. Um, and so the owner of the hotel decided, you know, not to try do to anything with them, except if a person could show that, you know, this particular piece of luggage or items belonged to them, then they would be returned. But by that time, you know, most people had kind of lost contact with, with a lot of that. So if you go to the Panama Hotel today, what they've done is, is all these things are down in the basement in the cellar, and they've cut out portions of the floor, put plexiglass over them, and you can kind of peer down into the basement and kind of see what it was like, you know, what, 70, 70 or so years ago in, uh, in that basement. So, so what happens is that in this story, um, it has to do with, with uh, some items being discovered at the Panama Hotel and then the course of these two people's lives afterwards. Yes? I was trying to imagine what it must have been like for uh, a family 
Yeah, but the question is the availability of just clothes or any items uh, in camp. What people would do is, yeah, I mean, that's a concern. I mean, what are you going to do about, you know, you've got growing kids and all of that. What do you do to, to keep them clothed? Uh, and, and I think aside from, you know, passing things down or around to others, people did have access to things like the Sears and Roebuck catalog, you know, the catalog companies. And so that's what they would do. They would just order merchandise like anyone else. Huh? Well, a lot of them, what they kind of expended whatever savings or whatever, you know, monies that, that they had. Um, they weren't given allowances in camps, so you can imagine that those who were without resources, financial resources, um, you know, had a very, very difficult time. But for those who may have had, you know, some resources, that was a way for them to, you know, to, to get uh, um, uh, clothing or, or other, other things. Um, so. One of the things, too, just to kind of along that line is, you know, in terms of the children or the families, um, you know, if you talk to a lot of the, the parents during that period of time, what they would say is, is because of, of the way in which the camp infrastructure was set up, where you had these mess halls, you know, and you had kind of like communal kinds of, of living and which kind of was, uh, you know, it, it went counter to being able to, you know, eat with your family or do things with your family because the youngsters, the teenagers, would just kind of like go off on their own and just kind of like, you know, they just kind of like became, um, you know, it, for them, if you talk to those who were, you know, in their early teens, it was probably a pretty good time for some of them because, you know, it was a carefree life. They were always around their friends. And then they could also, you know, do other things like just have their meal because people had to line up for meals and that sort of things. It became very difficult, I think, for families to always do things intact. And, and some of the studies have shown, sociological studies have shown that it contributed, you know, to, to you know, kind of a, a, a breakdown in some cases of, of, you know, of families because you didn't have the, you know, the strict social patterns that uh, you would if, you know, in, in, a, in a, regular, a regular setting. Yes, young lady. Um, I have a raise of like a preschool, and it's called Nursery Rhymes and Mickey Mouse, and it's like a little Yeah. Divine, Julie Otsuka, O T S U K I. I'm reading Buddha in the Attic. I just picked it up and to, to read on a plane ride uh, next week. So, yeah. This had to do with, with um, how people were told to conduct themselves when they left the camps, particularly during the war and they were resettling in places like Chicago. Um, uh, what, what they were basically told was, was that they needed to avoid drawing any suspicion or fear among the general populace uh, because of their presence. And so they were told that when they came to places like Chicago, you know, don't congregate in groups, you know, larger than four or five people, that sort of thing, because of what their neighbors might think, or, you know, the whole notion of just kind of like seeing a large group of, in this case, Japanese, you know, on a street corner, you know, how, you know, what kind of, of fear is that going to, to drum up? There was a, a government agency, it was called the War Relocation Authority, that was put into, kind of in charge of, of the whole resettlement effort. And so, and, and that was needed because when people came to Chicago, and Chicago, they came to Chicago because jobs were so plentiful. 
during the war. I mean, this was, I mean, everyone was coming to Chicago for a job during the war. So it became kind of a magnet uh, for Japanese as well. In fact, during the war and shortly thereafter, ja uh, Chicago had the largest uh, population of Japanese in the entire United States because so many had uh, uh, settled here. But that War Relocation Authority was responsible for also trying to, to the extent that they could, you know, find housing. Housing was a huge, huge problem. I mean, jobs were plentiful, but finding a place to stay that was reasonable was, was, was not easy to do. Um, but as they came here, there were those kinds of, you know, kinds of uh, warnings and they, you know, some of them were not so gentle because they were, you know, I mean, they would print them up in these little pamphlets and give them to the folks when they left the camp, you know, just saying don't, you know. And then the old other idea was to, to, to avoid their forming these so-called, you know, like Japan towns, you know, these little uh, enclaves that were purely Japanese, like you had on the West Coast in, you know, in Los Angeles or in San Francisco or Seattle or even in smaller places, you know, in Stockton, California or Sacramento or San Jose, you also had these little so-called Japan towns, but they wanted to try to disperse the community as much as possible so as not to create, you know, these so-called, you know, these ethnic or racial enclaves uh, in places like Chicago or Detroit or St. Louis or where, you know, wherever these, uh, the folks were settling. And there, you know, and there was kind of like, you know, that was like marginally successful. There was never a Japantown, for example, that was really formed in Chicago, although there was an area first on the south side of Chicago where Japanese settled. It was kind of in the um, uh, Woodlawn area of, 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 you know, near Hyde Park. And then on the near north side or along Division Street, which is nothing like it was today. You know, I mean, if you look at Division Street today, and if you've got property on Division Street, you're going to be doing pretty well. But back then, not so much. Um, they were like the marginal, you know, the very marginal areas of, of where people uh, were able to live. Uh, so there was, you know, as you're saying, there, there were attempts to kind of um, dictate the, the lives of folks even after they had left the camps. Any others? Yes, one more. When they reach, when the soldiers return, yeah. yeah. Well, the, you know, first of all, the jobs that that folks got here when they came, they were the very menial types of jobs that uh, uh, you know nobody else probably wanted, and because you know a lot of these folks who resettled in places like Chicago, you know, they had had a certain amount of education already, so they were able to, not rapidly, but they were able to kind of, of, of move up, you know, in, in certain jobs. A lot of the, the uh, veterans who came back, 442 guys, um, were able to, to, you know, a lot of them came to Chicago because their families had resettled here. That was, you know, the primary reason. Um, some, be, you know, may have just come here just because they didn't want to return to the West Coast. I mean, I've heard that a number of times from folks saying that while they kicked me out of here, why would I want to go back to a place where they didn't really want me? And so they, they would settle in places like Chicago, and a lot of them through things like the GI Bill, and a lot of them took, took advantage of that, you know, and received their, their college educations uh, as a result. And they, you know, and I, you know, for the veterans, you know, I can't tell you how much respect I have for them because, you know, they're the ones who really, even after the war, they, they were the ones who shaped and, and settled the community and helped build the community institutions. But I think even, even more so that, that what they did, uh, you know, their accomplishments, you know, through their sacrifice really changed public attitudes uh, in this country, you know, to, you know, to an extent that, you know, it, it shouldn't have had to happen that way, but that's the way it happened. I mean, I think their accomplishments became very, very well known. I mean, there was a movie made after the war about them. You know, Hollywood kind of caught on to it a little bit, but it's the whole idea that, you know, their sacrifice really um, did change public attitude uh, toward an entire group of people. And, and um, you know, what, what, what more can you say about uh, uh, them than that? Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it.
Thank you, Bill. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Um, thank you all for coming. I'd like to thank Mark and Andrew, your bunch of staff for helping put this together. And uh, if you're studying, you set this one up and you're staring at it, uh, all the chairs and stuff. But uh, I hope you enjoy it. Thank you.